Big news for Tesla. They have officially topped Toyota to become the largest automaker by market value. That's a big deal for any vehicle maker, let alone an electric vehicle maker. Now, the key here with this news story is we're talking about market value. So we're talking about share value, the share price. And as you know, Tesla has been a hot topic for investors. A lot of people want to own some Tesla stock. About you, Will, you got any Tesla stock? No, no, I should have. Uh, yeah, you, you think, right of, imagine where you'd be right now. Early days, Tesla stock. It wouldn't be that, you wouldn't be sitting there. No. No, no. You could be wearing that hat out on a beach somewhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tesla just became the world's most valuable automaker after the electric vehicle company's market value surpassed Toyota's for the very first time. Shares of Tesla gained 5% to hit an all a new all-time high of $1,135 per share, giving the company a valuation of roughly $206.5 billion with a B. Hmm. They spelled billion with a B. Compared with Toyota's valuation of about $202 billion. So you got a difference of $4.5 billion in there. Some quick math for you there, Will. Uh, like I said, it's a big deal. Not just, I mean, it would be a big deal for any automaker to surpass Toyota at this point. It's been tough in the auto biz, as I'm sure you've heard. Auto sales are down big time for a variety of reasons, none bigger than the current state of the world, the lockdown that's going on. People just not thinking about buying cars. However, Tesla is in this weird zone where, yes, it's a car company, but it's also a tech company. There's a lot more going on there, the incentive to look towards Tesla. And so from an investor perspective, I mean, investors aren't necessarily mapping to your typical economic behavioral stuff they're not saying oh tesla's got the biggest profits and therefore we're going to we want to pay a lot of money for a share a lot of times you're investing in a company based on the future what might happen what could happen and of course tesla still has this massive opportunity to disrupt the marketplace in a way that a lot of these other automakers haven't really figured out yet mm. they're beginning to work on it but tesla's kind of far along the electric path and, of course, they have the opportunity to go into other markets as well where they might not be yet mm-hmm. or they might not be in a big way. <laughs> Is this a new photo? Yeah. Oh, uh, wow. Like an hour ago. One he's, hour ago. He's at Kanye's house. One hour ago, Elon is having a, a quick visit with Kanye. And they, they have uh, probably many things to discuss. Also, uh, people are saying that Grimes was taking the photo. I don't know. She was trending right now. Because of the reflection. Yeah. It's a very key reflection there yeah. to be able to fit into that small gap where the window is to get yourself into the photo. Is it on purpose? Is it part of a bigger plan? Mm. We will never know. One thing I do have to say for certain is that uh, the orange, it's a real popping effect that's happening with the jacket on Kanye, the orange jacket there. Yes. It's a real popping effect. And is that a peach on Elon's shirt? Hard to tell. The caption posted by Ye on Twitter, when you go to your boy's house and you're both wearing orange. So he has an orange, yeah. a little orange embroidery or, or patch on his t-shirt, a black t-shirt. That's Elon Musk. Kanye, on the other hand, bright orange, zip up. What would you, it's not a jacket. Is it a jacket? Or would you, is that more of a, Zip up sweater, dare I say cardigan? What is that thing? Yeah. Something like that. Cardigan. This milestone underscores the vast investor enthusiasm for Elon Musk's automaker, which has yet to turn a profit on an annual basis. So that comes back to what I'm saying. It's a lot of what happens in the stock market in, in, a, in an attempt to determine the value of something. It depends on what people are willing to pay for it. In fact, Elon's made news multiple times saying, laughing at the stock price, essentially, mm-hmm. or saying that he even came out and said the stock is too high mm-hmm. at one point, which then forced it to go, cause it to go higher. Yeah. So it's there's a hype component to the stock market, and there's lots of hype around Tesla, and, and in many people's eyes, deservedly so. Mm-hmm. They, there's the China thing. They, maybe they can figure out India, bring some cars to India. There's other places to bring these cars 
and the potential for growth is obviously massive. Many people are, are seeing that themselves and attempting to buy this stock at that new price. However, if you're looking at each company's enterprise value, which includes debt, then Toyota is actually worth a little bit more. Toyota's $290 billion value exceeds Tesla's $252 billion, according to fact set data through March. So that includes well, what the company owes. Mm. And uh, Toyota's still a little bit ahead. But it's impressive nonetheless. It's a new player in the space. Imagine, Will, you talk about a new car company. I remember when Tesla first launched, they had the Ro Roadster. It was a Lotus. It was. It's not that long ago in car terms. These other players have been around forever. Toyota, the American automakers, Ford, and, and the rest of it. So you got to have some degree of uh, respect, some degree for what, what, how quickly Tesla has gotten here mm -hmm. to, be, to become, even if it's just market value, to become, of course, you'd love to see better market penetration, more Teslas out on the road. There's lots of Teslas out on the road, but it's still not the most common car on the road. Mm -hmm. And maybe that comes next as they figure out the production stuff and all the rest of it that goes with it. But market capitalization, Tesla, number one, beating out Toyota is kind of a big deal. Very impressive. Sticking with Tesla for a minute, here's a story. Here's one way they can, they can continue this path towards global automobile electric vehicle dominance. Tesla Model 3 police cars pay for themselves faster than expected, says police chief. So here we have a police department that purchased a number of Tesla Model 3s to replace their aging cruisers. They were, I believe, Dodge Chargers were replaced by Tesla Model 3s. And the uh, the goal here was to get a relatively high-performance vehicle. You drove the Model 3, Will. You know, what's, you know what's going on. You hit the pedal on a Model 3. You're moving. Oh, yeah. You're it's going. Fast. You're heading in a, in a direction. Mm -hmm. A lot of torque. I know you're a big torque guy. Yeah. So they, they had to replace these Dodge Chargers. They were looking for something affordable, as you would, you know, in these departments, they have, they have budgets and they, they're able to track their spending and figure out what the, how efficient the ownership of one of these vehicles is from a cost perspective. When you have a gasoline vehicle, you're burning fuel, it's costing you a few bucks, costing you money. Uh, however, with the Model 3, the cost savings, they can come down the road. You may have a slightly higher upfront cost, but then... You're not pumping gas into it, and and uh, presumably the cars are requiring less maintenance. That's what you're getting from this article right here. So they did the the analysis, the cost analysis, and they have determined that the break-even point is actually going to be 19 months of ownership as opposed to what they had originally projected as being two years of ownership. The reason that this is interesting is because uh, in, a, in a department, in a, in a law enforcement department, they're really using these vehicles in a way that a regular citizen really doesn't push them. By that, I mean tremendous um, amount of miles and, and being put on a vehicle in a short period of time. Yeah. Real stress testing. You're scanning the city. You're constantly moving. And, yeah. and the thing is always running, even when you're not necessarily uh, uh, driving. A lot you're, of idling. It, it's turned on all the time. And yeah. so it's a real, for a regular customer, this gives you a sense of confidence to know if it can pass the stress test that a police department could put on a vehicle. Now you're uh, motivated yourself saying, okay, that, that's probably a somewhat decent vehicle. Now it's important to note, it's not like these things have been rolled out in a tremendous number of police departments. There's about a dozen, I believe, at this point. This is just the latest one. And this police department has only bought five of them. So the, the, the transition takes time in these, ty in these type of scenarios. The, you're moving over a lot of aged vehicles. You're going to wait for those ones to die and then replace them and think about putting a Tesla in place. And you really need a bigger sample size to figure out for sure if they make the best police cruiser uh, commercial vehicle. However, these five Model 3s, this, this department is very happy with. And it's, it's a signal. There's yet another good sign for Tesla that, I mean, imagine if... if if it sets some sort of chain reaction, that's a lot of vehicles that would transition over. And those sales typically go to domestic automakers, whether it's Ford. You see around here uh, a lot of Ford Explorers mm. for police vehicles. You also see Ford F-150s are starting to be police vehicles. And you do see, I guess you do see the odd Dodge Charger the Chargers, as well. Yeah. So 
when one department changes, has, has a good result, the rest of them can say, okay, it works over there. It's probably going to work over here. And then it can flip. And well, the rest uh, will be history. We could see a massive penetration of electric vehicles fast if, they, if these various departments choose to pick them up. Sticking with electric vehicles, last story on the topic. It's just I couldn't avoid this one because this one's, uh, it's it sparked me a little bit. It, it, it got my attention for a number of reasons. First off, this company, Van Moof, they have this really nice looking electric bike mm. uh a very minimal simple looking electric vehicle i think that's that's going to be the th that style is going to be the one to break through because it, it appeals to the widest variety of people and it doesn't really look like an electric bike at all it looks like a regular bike it's a bit fatter in the center there but it looks a lot like a regular bike so you don't have to be offending anyone well you you ride around they think it's just another they think you're you're pedaling with your own uh, manpower mm -hmm. meantime you're cruising it's a giant battery a giant with a, yeah, there's a battery hidden in there. And so anyway, that's a big part of this company, the design, the, the aesthetic, and the, the minimal nature of it. Well, they got, they've got some problems right now, which aren't, maybe aren't even problems, mm. because it's drawing more attention to the brand. Here you got us talking about it, and we're on the internet, and a couple of people are watching. Mm. Nevertheless, they've got this issue where a big market for them in, in France, they put out this new commercial, and the commercial... Uh, was not accepted by the regulatory body in France that determines whether or not a commercial can happen or not. And maybe you want to play just a little bit of the commercial here. Time to Ride the Future is the name of the commercial. And I'll just describe it for you. You have what looks like a very high-performance vehicle. And this, this video is sort of panning around the outside of the vehicle. And in the reflections of the vehicle, you see uh, um, a commotion and, and traffic jams. And you see... Uh, the exhaust fumes from vehicles, and then the car, the automobile, melts into this minimalistic bike that they want you to buy. It says, ride into the future, get your act together. What are you doing sitting in traffic? Okay, hmm. you watch the commercial. Well, first of all, before I continue here, Will, you just watched the commercial. You saw enough of it to, to catch an idea. Are you offended? What do you think happened there? How are you feeling? Are you feeling anxious? Do you want a bike? What's going on? Well, in the reflections of the uh, car... Yes. Is there like chaos or something? There's chaos. It's just There's some chaos in there. Well, it's crowds. I wouldn't say it's chaos. There's crowds. They're reaching. It looks like commotion. Mm -hmm. No, I wouldn't be offended. You're okay with it. Yeah. Well, the uh, regulatory body, ARPP, says that it discredits the automobile sector while creating a climate of anxiety. That's the official line on it. I wouldn't say they're necessarily wrong about that. There is a kind of anxious feeling inside of the thing. Uh, and yeah, of course, it's discrediting the automobile sector. That's what they're attempting to replace. Mm -hmm. They're telling you to get rid of your car and get an electric bike. But what else should they be telling you? Yeah. It seems kind of what you would do if you had a company like this. Uh, there's, a, there's another statement here from a representative that says you should not fall into the ease of bashing when you just have to promote your product. So I guess I kind of feel that. It, it could have been a more optimistic approach. Maybe the coexistence of the automobile and the electric bike. Uh, but when you want, what is it, 2,000 euros for an electric bike, you're going to need to convince some people to give up their car for that kind of money or, or to presume that this is a substitute right. for that mode of transportation. Uh, look, I'm going to get down to the brass tacks here, Will. The automobile sector is getting fired at from all sides. It's in, it's in some pretty rough shape right now, and particularly in France as well, which is where this advertisement was set to take place. They're looking for bailouts. They're looking for government money. They're looking for help. And if you're a government agency, you're sitting here thinking, wait, right now, this automobile sector, which employs this uh, vast amount of citizens that are eventually going to vote for me at some point and don't want to lose their job. Uh, if there's an advertisement that's taking such a direct shot at that industry at the same time that I'm trying to figure out a way to bail them out to keep these jobs, I'm really going to consider what I'm what I'm approving here. Now, for the record, I'm just showing you the other side. I'm not suggesting that I agree with it. I'm just showing you the other side. I think, hey, man, the ad should be able to take place. I don't, it's not like it's showcasing violence. It's not, sure, maybe there's an anxiousness about it, but that falls within your typical type of expression for me. 
I, I, I think it's actually kind of cool. The car melts away. It's still up to the, the individual to interpret what they want to take from it, but it's all very straightforward the way I watch it. You want to sell me an expensive electric bike. Your pitch is that I'm going to replace my car and that my car is problematic, and here's the reasons it's problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, are they lying? No, it's not a lie. It's gridlock. You're trapped in traffic. That's real. Mm -hmm. You're using more oil and gas. That's real, too. They didn't go so far as to necessarily call you evil for doing so. Mm. It's all, it's it, it's artistic enough that I think it's okay. But like I said previously, it doesn't even really matter. Because now here we are talking about it because they banned it. Had they just shown the commercial in the first place, this, this company probably would have got less attention. Mm. Nonetheless. So it puts it in a really, it's a funny thing about the internet. You try to suppress a signal, the signal gets louder. Mm. And we we see this happening over and over again. And now more people know about this cool electric bike. I think the future is some combination. It's never black and white. It's always some shade of gray. It's some, there's nuance to it. It's possible you own some efficient vehicle that you drive as well as the bike. You use the bike sometimes. You use the car for other endeavors. You can't fit a fridge on the, in, the, in the back of a uh, electric bike. No. Or let alone most cars you would drive in France. Yeah. But certainly in an F-150, you can you can lug some stuff around. And I love it. I love the versatility of being able to do so. Does it mean that you should be driving it for all circumstances around town? Should you be take, uh, taking it down the street for to the mailbox? No. No, you probably shouldn't. No. So yeah, I, I agree. You could do a slightly more optimistic version, and maybe they have. But the point of this particular piece of art is to make an impact. I believe it's done so. Mm -hmm. And they're going to sell a few bikes. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, their bike sales are way up. So they, they're doing they, well. Yeah, they're doing well. Uh, what can I say here? In May, the company said its first quarter sales were up dramatically compared to the same period last year, increasing in all of its main markets, including Germany up 226%, the UK up 184%, Netherlands 140 US 138 and France 92%. Now, this uh, apparently this uptake was driven partially by discounts on the S3 and X3 bikes, but nonetheless, well, look at this. People are looking uh, not not just for the environmental component, but for the cost savings. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the the vehicle can be expensive, mm. and people are are sensitive right now. Yeah, as you, as you would be with the uncertainty in the world. Speaking of sensitive, be people being sensitive to cost, we have a Motorola device, an unlocked version of the Edge. You remember I did the video on Unbox Therapy of their new flagship model, Motorola. Oh my goodness, putting out a flagship device in 2020, it was a thousand dollar smartphone. It's kind of like, mm, man, I don't know, people are sensitive right now. I don't know how interested they will be. Of course, there was the Verizon connection, which means there will likely at some point be subsidies applied to it in exchange for some sort of Verizon contract. It also supported the hottest form of 5G that was on Verizon as well. So it was going to be a fast choice. And I have to say, having played with the hardware, Will, I was pretty impressed. The thing felt sturdy. It felt solid. It felt robust. There was glass everywhere. There were cameras. Screens were curving and things were happening. Mm. And that's where they got their 999 from. But of course, people want those things People still want those things in a lower price point, and that's where this one comes in. It's an unlocked edge with a $700 price tag. Will not be locked or sold exclusively through Verizon. There's no release date yet, but it takes a lot of the DNA from that more expensive model, which I like, and brings it down to $700. Now, of course, you're going to have to give up a few things to get down to $699 from the $999 of the Edge Plus, but you're still going to get 6 gigs of RAM. You're still going to get 256 of storage. The same 6.7-inch edge display, which is one of the more impressive displays that I've seen, you take a step back in the processing department going to a Snapdragon 765 from the 865 flagship. You knew it was going to happen. You want to save $300. You knew it was going to happen. Battery goes from 5,000 milliamp, milliamp hours to 4,500. You give up wireless charging. And, of course, the Plus model has more RAM. But... Here's, here's a big but. Do you need all those things? That's the question. It's the conversation we're having in 2020. What is the value proposition? Where do you get the most for the least? $700 is not, does not make this the cheapest phone. But I can tell you from personal experience, the build quality 
it's it feels very premium. Mm. So I understand where they're coming from. Keep in mind the camera bump fairly large. You do have a wobble on this phone. However, if you hold this seven hundred dollar phone, you will feel as if, pres uh, assuming the build is the same as the Plus model, you will feel like you're holding a far more premium phone. However, I still think seven is hot. Seven hundred. And I think the real move right now to get people going, get the juices flowing, is more five to six. Right. I'm just saying. And even below that. So it's it's all going to depend on this OnePlus Nord. A lot is going to depend on this OnePlus Nord, where they can get the market rejuvenated and find that right, point, right price point. It would be insane if that thing came close to 300. Insane. Even though mm -hmm. it's been a rumor, it would be insane. Well, yeah. I, I would love to see the reaction to that. China's Huawei and ZTE officially designated national security threats by the FCC. Uh, I'm not. I can't say I'm surprised. We've had, we've had just, just all kinds of negative news relating to this relationship. It's been ongoing. This is kind of uh, simply a progression of that that effect. You now have this label placed on these companies, uh, making it increasingly difficult for any U.S. businesses to to have ongoing relationships with these brands, Huawei and ZTE. U.S. carriers cannot use an $8.3 billion government subsidy program known as the Universal Service Fund to purchase, maintain, or support any equipment or services from both of these vendors. So it's going to make it very, very difficult for any carrier to seriously consider using technologies from either of these companies going forward because they can't access this massive government subsidy, which is going to make their purchases effectively cheaper if they're willing to go with other brands. And these companies would have to would have to uh, chop their prices so to make it. You understand what I, where I'm going here? It's just mm -hmm. it becomes impossible for them to do business. And this designation, on another level, would just raise enough concern for anyone thinking of do, of having ongoing business relationship with either of these companies because. Because the the assumption would be that there would that there would be this continued prohibitive behavior that could shut you down in the future or cause massive problems for you. Why would you invest in hardware from these companies at this moment? Critics of Huawei and ZTE have claimed that their networking equipment could be used for China uh, by China for espionage. We've heard all of this before with today's orders and based on the overwhelming way of evidence, the FCC's Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau has designated Huawei and ZTE a national security risk to America's communications networks and to our 5G future. That was said by the chairman of the FCC. That guy, you remember him, made famous on the net neutrality stuff, Ajit Pai. Mm. You remember he was a huge meme for a moment. He well, yeah. He's still there. He's still doing what he's doing, and uh, Huawei and ZTE are currently his target by the looks of it. So, yeah, it's just a, a continued progression towards what, what seems like uh, it seems like a foregone conclusion at this point, Will. I don't see it flipping back around. It, it would be hard to imagine a handshake and a, and, and a hug taking place. And, and all of a sudden, Huawei popping up in the U.S. in a big way and elsewhere. It's going to continue to be this strange uphill battle, this this bizarre relationship or lack thereof. And Huawei's going to have to keep, and ZTE for that matter, keep turning their head and their focus towards markets where, where they can yeah. penetrate, where they can uh, exist. Because it seems to be that the marketplace for those brands continues to shrink. Yeah, especially when you're talking about infrastructure of 5G networks. Like, you have to build the foundation and then... That's it. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, and of course, of yesterday years. we talked about the TikTok stuff with India. So you have to presume now you can add India to the list that's feeling this way about uh, potentially partners like Huawei and ZTE. Germany was on the fence. You have the UK in the mix, Australia. All your markets are seeing this type of move and they're reacting. They're just following suit. They're reacting to it as well and you can't blame them. Mm -hmm. Right, you can't blame them. So it's well, you can blame them, depending what side of it you're on. Well, you can't blame yeah. them, but you can understand where the where the. It's a huge, huge investment, and if there is any minute amount of fear that it could be a bad investment for a number of reasons, they're going to address it. They're going to consider it. Mm -hmm. It's it's understandable, regardless of which side of it you land on. Right, regardless. 
Uh, this next one, this kind of caught me off guard. Google working on a product. It's a very niche edge uh, project. Okay. A product called Keen, Google Keen. It did not, it, I had no, I'm, I'm actually happy it showed up in my news feed today because it, I had not had any exposure to it, heard that it was a thing at all. It's very small scale right now, but it is a, apparently going to be a rival to Pinterest. And look, <laughs> the history of bizarre Google projects, social media, it's been a wide variety of things. And Google appears to be somewhat fearless when it comes to throwing stuff at the wall and seeing if it sticks. Mm -hmm. And fearless when it comes to shutting things down if it doesn't stick. Like Google yes. Plus, a big example. They got rid of it. They warned you, get rid of it. Uh, it's a piece of garbage. They just admit it. I mean, they don't say it in those words, but yeah, they just, yeah. they typically admit it. I like that, actually. Don't, yeah. don't, I mean, you can't maintain that thing. That thing was a mess. A Google lot of Plus. privacy concerns if it's not maintained. Exactly. Right? Don't act like, we're, why are we holding on to this thing? Just get rid of it. So anyways, uh, I'm not a huge Pinterest user, but I have used it in the past around certain projects to just oh, okay. get ideas and things like this. Uh, I, I, I see the value in Pinterest. It really does offer something kind of unique. Like, but like I said, I'm no I'm no power user by any means. It's it's big for food. You're seeing a lot of food stuff. Fashion, Pinterest is big. Uh, de decor, uh, in, uh, interior design. What what are these things that I'm naming? You know, once upon a time I was trying to, I was trying to uh, get inspired around a particular aesthetic. Like yeah, some sort of mood board. Oh yes, moods, yeah. things like this. Yeah, and it's amazing. It can take you down a path. You can see some some really cool things and organize your thoughts and your inspiration in a way. Well, Google doesn't have a product really in that department. I don't know what the closest thing they have is. Maybe Google Images, really, if you think about it. And That's Google true. Images is such a huge utility and resource that kind of goes overlooked because you're just so used to having it mm -hmm. as a utility. However, organizing what you're working on within Google Images, where do you put the things? There's really nothing there. So Google Keen is kind of a combination of Google and Pinterest in one place. And there's a, 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 a kind of cool little video. You can play a piece of it here. Keen, connect, curate, and expand your favorite things. And that was me, voyage into new sci-fi worlds. It's kind of similar oh. approach to what I took. Oh. But it can be around a project. It can be around a uh, an enthusiasm or passion in a particular department. It can be around a hobby that you can set these things up. You can invite people to what are essentially your boards if you want collaborators or if you just want to share ideas around a particular thing. Uh, uh, maybe it's a recipe, things like this. It's, it actually looks kind of nice. Mm -hmm. The interface looks kind of nice. Maybe even, it's more. It's, it's definitely sim a little simpler looking than Pinterest. But the cool integration for me is around Google because Google is such a massive piece of it. You can... Simply start to type a web search and it will suggest, based on popular web searches, things that you may want to add into your particular space. And uh, it can get really granular because Google search is really granular. So the example that is used in this Android Authority article is Star Trek. And you just start the search Star Trek and it populates with things that you can add with a plus sign, such as original series or uh season one or a particular episode or mm. something that could be i mean i don't know how great of an example star trek is but you can imagine you type hamburger in there and you got all the varieties and variants of ways you might want to take it mm -hmm. uh hamburger with avocado and you get you can get real moody i said that because i had a hamburger with avocado last night it was unbelievable i don't yeah. know if you do like avocado or i do yeah okay so yeah. the avocado is like smashed up Okay. And it was the and it was the uh, burger with uh, with uh, uh, some aged cheddar cheese, a little bit of bacon, and then the smashed avocado. Sounds delicious. Honestly, it was. Uh, I got a shout out to family on that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I honestly, I that was it, I had nothing to do with the uh, construction of that. Yeah. But I took one bite. And I was just, the whole day melted away. It was no problems anymore mm -hmm. for me. And it's healthy. Avocado? It's good to know, yeah. Yeah, it, uh, I just recommend it. I don't know, if anybody's looking for something to try, if you want a way to eat avocado, try and put on a burger. I mean, I'm sure people have done it before, yeah. but that's my mood board right now. There you go. Avocado on a burger is my mood board right now. Anyways, 
you'll see a series of Google search related web links based on your title. You click tap on the links that are closest to your interest and then you click tap on them and then you click or tap on them to create a box. The reason that it says click or tap is because there's a mobile app. The way to interact with this right now is via the web or an Android app. Mm -hmm. And so you can create boxes around really granular interests. And so it all, it feels very uh, interesting to me. I don't know if it'll last though. That's the end piece of this article. Google, like I said, they throw things like this at the wall. They have so many people working on these little projects. You never know what's going to stick around and what's going to, they're going to just ditch. It will ha probably have to do well in order for it to stick around. I, I hope it does for a little bit. Mm. I'm, I'm curious to see how it works out. However, Pinterest is a big time player in the space for people looking to do something similar to this. How do you convince people that are already on Pinterest to give this one a shot? Or how do you convince people who haven't used Pinterest yet that this is what they need? It's a, it's a kind of an, uh, I don't know. It's a, um, do you market it? You buy some YouTube pre-roll? Hey, come, yeah. come try out our new thing. Uh, either way, whatever, there you have it. It's a small time deal for, for now, but maybe it becomes a big time deal. Mm -hmm. Google Keen. What do you think about the name? Keen is what you're keen about, what you're keen on. It's memorable. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Not bad. Pizza Hut Wendy's expected to file for bankruptcy. That got oh, Vin's man. attention back there. He turned his head so fast when he heard that. He my, was, my ears are perked up. Your ears are perked yeah. up as well. All right. One thing you can definitely do is mute the uh, initial job loss claims there as part of the article here. <laughs> the, look at that report. Just numbers. Terrible. Three red arrows going down. Oh, man. That's not good. Yeah. Just, it, it, that's what you take away. It's, it's not good. Whatever it is. Dow Jones heading downwards. NASDAQ's looking all right. Maybe you can, maybe Tesla's helping out with that. I don't know. Are they on the NASDAQ? Anyway, tech stocks. This is not the end of the world for Pizza Hut and Wendy's, but it goes to show you how even companies that are doing well amidst the current climate in the world also have their problems. That's what's happening here. Actually, Pizza Hut is up a little bit given the current situation. Takeout is up a little bit given the current situation. drive throughs are up a bit given the current situation, which, of course, Wendy's has those. Fast food, people are ordering the food. The food delivery services will. Mm. So they're actually opening stores right now, as funny as that is, while concurrently filing for bankruptcy. And once again, it has to do with that pesky old thing, debt, will he do? Mm. Construction of business, owing people money. Uh, borrowing a few bucks to pay back later. You got to pay the interest interest payments. You know how that goes. What's your advice to the youngsters out there on debt? Oh, wait, I have a question. So they're building like restaurants during this time? Is that? Let's see what it says here. Or is it just rent? Let's see what it says here. It says, a number of franchise restaurants have, current, have declared bankruptcy since the pandemic hit, including Chuck E. Cheese. Remember Chuck E. Cheese? Yeah. We reported on that as well. Uh, Pizza Hut was struggling since before the pandemic hit in the U.S., but it's proven to be one of the winners from changing consumer behavior. Quarantined diners have turned to delivery and carry out to eat safely, with a number of pizza chains actually reporting growth. Hmm. In early May, Pizza Hut had, had its highest average sales in delivery and carry out in the U.S. In the past eight years, according to the parent company, Yum! Brand. So in the last eight years, they were spiking. They were doing all right. Oh. In fact, you look at the stock price. Wendy's is actually up today by the looks of it. Oh. Um, so I don't have to be worried. Kansas-based NPC, which opened its first Pizza Hut in re a restaurant in 1962, employs roughly 37,000 people. Their debt load is the thing that has burdened the company's outlook for more than a year now. The company has spent on remodeling its units. And growing, and, and a number of chains have, have attempted to do the same, and they've asked franchisees to modernize their individual stores. Mm. So that all, it all costs money to keep up with the times, and in oft, often these brands are having to borrow money in order to do that, and you get in debt, and then you pay the interest payments, and the interest payments aren't helping anyone, are they? So what does this mean? I, well, if the sales are good, then it's okay. They file for bankruptcy. They do the restructuring. They use the new growth to pay off the debts. But what's weird is as much as Pizza Hut's takeout business is up, that's still a sit-down restaurant, or at least a number of them are. The Pizza Hut over here is not. 
Mm. The Pizza Hut, uh, our local Pizza Hut is just takeout strictly. So right. that's a reorganization that takes time and is going to cost money. So they could be okay. Mm-hmm. However, I was surprised to find out that there's way more Pizza Huts than Wendy's. 1,200 Pizza Huts, 385 Wendy's. Does that sound right to you, Will? Um, yeah, I mean, I think so. I, I see a lot of Pizza Huts around. So you think there's only 385, uh, how, how, how many Wendy's located? Doesn't that seem low to you in the U.S.? Um, yeah, it kind of does. See, here it's, uh, yeah, I knew that sounded weird. Wendy's opens its 500th international restaurant. Well, maybe they're citing just U.S. numbers. Anyways, there's a few more Wendy's than that, but nonetheless, that's a lot of Pizza Huts. The uh, 1,200 Pizza Hut restaurants. Mm. So anyway, Pizza Hut, it bring back the memories for you. I don't know if you ever went to the physical location where you go in oh, and, yeah. and, the, and they had the buffet. Did you ever experience that? I didn't do the buffet, Okay, but uh, I remember their buildings were pretty iconic. Very iconic with the pla- red plastic cups. I, it used to be the trend when I was a kid, Will. I played on the, on the hockey teams, uh, you know, the team sports. And after a big tournament or something, the team, it would always be the team party mm-hmm. would happen at the Pizza Hut. Uh. And and everyone would show up and it would just be, uh, it would be easy to organize because you just throw a bunch of pizzas on the table, yeah. you yeah. hand everybody their red cup yeah. and good times ensue. Well, and nobody great. complained. And great. so that's a bit unfortunate if they have to change their model, but it seems they're going to have to change their model. Mm-hmm. I saw something interesting in a documentary. I watched the uh, first Pizza Hut was opened. Two brothers, I believe, they got a loan from their mom for like five or six hundred bucks or something. Oh. Back in the day, I think 1960s. Anyway, I, 1962 was the first one. Anyway, I might be off on the specifics, but a feel good story. Uh, shout out to Pizza Hut, Wendy's, bankruptcy, bankruptcy, but not the end. Right? We're both, what do you got? Your fingers crossed? The dying mall has a new lease on life apartments. What do you, okay, I have some weird obsession with the death of retail, the death of the mall. I'm not saying I want it to happen, but it's such a curious thing for me. It was, it's a relatively modern invention, the mall, the super mall, the place you walk around, the sights and sounds, Mm. uh, relatively modern in human history, the way we have them set up right now. And... You've seen the channels on YouTube where they're, they're, they, 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 they explore the abandoned malls. It's already started to happen, this retail apocalypse. And it's just, there's this weird kind of uh, poetic thing to it. The dreams and the, the promise of the mall as the community gathering place. And now, of course, the downfall, or at least the, the progression towards a different reality from the or future from the one that was imagined back when these monoliths these mega structures were being built Mm -hmm. as the the future way that in which people would shop Uh, we've seen tremendous difficulty and trouble in the retail sector for the big players the uh what what a mall would call their what what is it the cornerstone what do they call the the flagship stores there's a name for it the anchors the anchors imagine you build a mall and you Get your anchors in there as a as a as a mall landlord. Mm. We got Sears, <laughs> Zellers. Was that, did Zellers anchor malls though, or are they were more of a plaza store? Mm. They did for Square One. They they anchored Square One. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, they had the four. I think he, around here, I think it was more a plaza store as the anchor to an outdoor plaza with the parking lot out front. Uh However, they did, you know what? They did move to the mall at one point as well. So yeah, Zellers was a player here. I guess Kmart in the States may have been an anchor. Mm -hmm. Uh, The department stores as well, the the Nordstrom's and the the Macy's of the world. Uh, We had Eaton's at one point, the biggest mall in the city, Eaton Center. People are going to remember it. Uh, Eaton's was a huge anchor. They bailed. Everybody, every, you know, it's it's tough out there. It's tough and it's rough. And it's rough and tumble. And especially for those anchor stores, which it seems like they're all going to be gone. Yeah. Now, the thing about those anchor stores, anchor department stores, they occupied a tremendous amount of space in the mall. 
if you go to a mall and those spaces are unoccupied, it really is an eerie feeling, isn't it? Yeah, multiple floors. Multiple floors spaces. on the corners. They were the uh, big entry points for yes. the mall as well because parking they would lots. the parking lots would be centered around them and they would have multiple entrances. Yeah. So for them to just uh, evaporate, it creates a very strange void. Even if some of the retailers do better or are able to, to survive, the smaller ones, you know, I heard, like, for example, Lululemon is doing well, mostly online, obviously, right now. But let's say they want to hang around at the mall. If the rest of it is, is empty, it kind of kills the mall vibe. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that brings us to this story here. A, a, a potential pitch for how to solve this situation is to take those anchor gigantic stores and turn them into apartments. Mm. And this is, of course, a majorly futuristic type of development idea. It's only happening in a really small way right now. But here's the pitch to you, Willie Do. Uh, the, okay. the person, the Willie Do that lives on planet Earth in 2020, the guy sitting across from me. Mm -hmm. You get yourself an apartment. And it's in this newly developed uh, uh, anchor mall location. And you're on, I don't know, you're four stories up or whatever it might be. Mm. You got, it's a nice, it's a penthouse for you, of course. And down below you, you have a few flagship retail. Uh, you have a few restaurants to eat at. And we have to go into the future, obviously, because no yes. one, you can't be in a restaurant right now. But let's say the world is okay and you can visit the restaurant. Nice little food court. You got some food down there, some yeah. entertainment. Mm -hmm. Maybe you watch a movie. I don't know what you do. Uh, maybe, uh... Uh, maybe you have one of those spots with the uh the the what is it it's almost like an arcade for adults what's the one that popped off in the city before this whole thing hit what was Dave the name and of busters? it no not dave and busters there was a new one rec room rec room yeah yeah rec room but dave maybe there's a little there's something like that in there i'm just building it out for willie do's paradise yeah, right I now hear, i hear you <laughs> are you considering this lifestyle uh personally no I like property. You you want but, some land. Uh, yeah, well, you I like mean, a little bit of grass and mm -hmm. some fresh air. And I, I can see someone living in one of these uh, big department stores. Yeah. You know. Well, I mean, people people agreed. Uh, they signed up to live in a skyscraper on the 65th floor. Yeah. And there's certain amenities that are usually on the ground level there. Yeah. It's not all that different. I mean, you would have to get around the weird psychological component of I'm living in an old department store. Mm -hmm. But if it looks is, like this picture here uh, on uh, Bloomberg City Lab, that looks like a kind of a nice place. It doesn't look like a terrible place to no. be. Yeah, it, it looks great. You got your underground parking. Maybe if you're single, uh -huh. you might bump into somebody. You meet you meet a person because you're single and you're out. and Yeah, eating some uh, a and <laughs> at the food court so anyway they want to they want to mix you know i'll say from an efficiency standpoint you get a lot of your stuff online these days anyway mm -hmm. if you have your entertainment right down below you can really low, lower your footprint if you're if you care about the environmental thing mm -hmm. you just walk downstairs you can manage you do a few groceries down there you can think about it well i don't know i'm just saying think about it i agree with you i i love gr uh, grass yeah maybe they should have some you ever uh, smell and fresh and grass mm -hmm. after it's been cut Yes. Oh, my God. Or the morning dew on the grass. I'll tell you, man, I can't. You know? I realize it's not a reality for a lot of people, but even if you yes. don't have grass nearby or in the front of the house, you should travel mm. uh, every so often, get, get outdoors to experience it because I can feel the stress. The stress goes when you... <sighs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's an instant yeah. stress relief. The uh, the green. The yes. green. So you got to get some green. And maybe these places could have some green as well yeah, on the rooftop. Maybe the rooftop, yeah. The rooftop yeah. could have the green grass. And now you're all set. Anyway, this is actually happening at a place called the Alderwood Mall in Linwood, a suburb north of Seattle. It will be a 300-unit apartment complex to revitalize the 41-year-old shopping center. That's an old mall, mm. ladies and gentlemen. And they don't know what to do with them, to be honest. Do you knock them down? You don't know what to do with them. Commercial tenants in the, in the mall will still take up around 90,000 square feet of retail. Developers expect it to reopen in 2022 with this 300-unit apartment complex. They imagine a village square 
where people come together, hit the cafe. Congregate. Come on, Will. I'm trying to sell you here. I'm, I'm the real estate agent. I'm trying to get you a unit. No? Still um, no? Maybe for like a year. I'll try yeah, it that's out. not great. You know. You're not really into it. I don't know if anyone around here is going to take it. Vin might take it. Vin, what do you think? A mall apartment, Vin. Yes or no? We got a maybe from Vin. We got a really subtle maybe. He's not really. It's a great it. idea. Um, I think because the people living there will, you know, um, be more like there for the retail store. Yeah, the I, it's going to just stimulate it. Listen, it's going to be a tough pitch right now coming off what we're coming off. I know. As people know. not being around each other. Uh, however, if all that, if you put all that aside, I think it's a futuristic way to think about living, which is kind of funny because it's really an old way. If you think about the olden days in a village. It's like a town hall. Yeah, town hall. Everybody would be. Marketplace. Everything would be tight and together. And then you get this stinking virus thing that just like. Who wants to be in a town hall? Who wants to be close to anyone? So whatever. It's a tough, it's a tough pitch right now, but I like to, to see and explore the different ways in which we can reimagine our spaces, and particularly the mall. I have a soft spot for the mall, as you can probably tell. Mm -hmm. And those are some very fancy spaces you just brought up right there. Mm. All right, there you have it. Electric vehicles, the future of malls. Pizza Hut is going to be there along for the ride. Willie Do is single-handedly going to ensure that they survive this bankruptcy.